We are sticking with the Great Western theme this week and today we are going to look at a building masterpiece the city of Truro herself would have travelled on, or in so to speak. So let's delve underground and look at the longest railway tunnel the UK had ever seen, the Severn Tunnel. The River Severn is a beautiful impressive site and its estuary is the largest in the UK. But for the people who lived on the mouth of the estuary, especially those that wanted to trade and travel to South Wales, it was notorious. The only way to cross the wide expanse of water was by boat. It probably would have been okay. However, the estuary is known for its extreme tides. The tides can be so bad, many judged on the day whether they were looking at a short time sailing or a very, very long time walking. In the new and modern world of the 1800s, this unreliability simply wouldn't do. The first semblance of a tunnel was as early as 1810. Roger Tipping, a keen engineer, had, had experienced building tunnels before, having just completed the air tunnel, the longest tunnel in the world at the time. His vision was to start a tunnel in Newham in Wales, go under the estuary, and end up in Arlingham, Gloucester. After being granted parliamentary assent for the project, Roger and the new company, the Severn Tunnel Company, raised £20,000. Everything was planned and Roger was confident in his success. He even had planned the cost of the fares for the different types of traffic the tunnel would see. At first, things went well. By 1811, the tunnel was a mile long with an engine room and for a pump engine at the end. The tunnel was 13 foot high and appeared to be very stable. The local inn near to the tunnel entrance reported that by 1812 the tunnel was 500 yards under the Severn and the end was in sight. On the 13th of November, Roger's dream came crumbling down. Miners digging uncovered a small tunnel breach. The water flowed slowly at first and the miners thought they'd hit an underground spring. But the crack widened and the miners knew they had unleashed the full power of the River Severn. They raced out of the tunnel and barely made it out alive before the tunnel was flooded. The plans were abandoned and Roger was forced back to the drawing board. But his biggest backer in the project, a Gloucester Bank, went on to suffer financial ruin. It can't be proven, but it was suspected that this was the motive in the attempted murder of Roger and his wife just two years later. Many years went by with no real solution to the problem. Ferries tried to do what they could, but the problems with the tides persisted. For the Bristol and South Wales Union Railway, it gave them particular headaches. The steam ferries would be late or couldn't run at all, then the railway would suffer huge costs and angry passengers. In 1872, after much discussion and plans, it was decided to pick up the spades and try the tunnel idea once again. The Severn Valley Tunnel Railway was given the green light and construction was given to the Great Western Railway. Mr Charles Richardson, who came up with the plans, was charged with overseeing the project with Mr John Hawkshaw appointed as consulting engineer. Both engineers realised the mistakes of tipping and decided not to start the tunnel close to the shoreline. Instead, they made the tunnel over four miles long with two miles under the estuary. Including the two approaches, the tunnel was nearing, ne nearing seven miles. The depth of the tunnel was also considered. The engineers knew the roof had to withstand not only differing water pressures, but the mass movement of water that came with the tides. They decided that the roof be at least 30 foot, with some of the deepest parts of the tunnel having a 50 foot thick roof. Work started pretty quickly and began a year later. Instead of using the tried and tested practices like used on the underground or tippings, the Great Western used tunnel shafts. These shafts would be sunk to a predetermined depth and thanks to some careful mathematics, 
The shafts were placed perfectly in the tunnel's centre. From there, the men dug top and bottom headings that were seven foot square, and then the men would dig in this seven foot heading until they hit the next shaft's seven foot heading, making a channel. The shafts had a secondary purpose, providing ventilation to the working miners. From the seven foot heading, the tunnel was widened out to the desired width and the walls were shored up. The biggest obstacle, of course, was the river. Extra care was made on the shoreline and blasting was used to move stubborn rock where needed. But the work was painfully slow and in four years the Western Railway only had one shaft and 1600 yards of progress. The Great Western knew they were in over their heads and offered tenders to anyone who could finish the work. Two contractors took up the challenge. Oliver Norris and Roland Brotherhood agreed to start at either end of the tunnel and meet in the middle. Work progressed much faster, but on the 16th of October 1879, history repeated itself and the miners hit a freshwater spring. The pumps in the shafts keeping them dry could not cope with the 6,000 gallons a minute and were quickly overwhelmed with the pressure. Men were overpowered and forced to flee. Unlike tipping, however, only one shaft was affected, and it was not the River Severn, but the spring, later named the Great Spring, would require a powerful pump to keep it at bay. Despite the blow, work continued. Sir John Hawkshaw was asked to take overall responsibility for the project, with Charles acting as joint engineer. Hawkshaw ordered the tunnel be lowered by 15 feet and ordered powerful pumps to clear the Great Spring's water damage. It took two months for the tunnels to dry out, but after the last of the water was cleared, work progressed fast. December also saw the beginning of brick arcing. But a freak snowstorm ground the project to a halt. Coal needed for the vast pumping stations and building materials were stuck in sidings, so the men, desperate to keep the tunnel dry, borrowed coal from farms and cottages, but it was another two-week setback for the Great Western. On the 26th of September 1881, nearing 10 years since the project started, the two ends of the tunnel finally broke through. The process of widening it and shoring up was ready to begin, but the Great Spring was not done yet. In 1883 it broke through again and overpowered the pumps, and less than a week later a large tidal wave hit the lowlands and took out several pumping engines. The tidal water cascaded into the tunnels below, trapping 85 people. Luckily, they all escaped serious harm. Water was becoming a huge problem. The Great Spring was barricaded by several head walls and the pumps on the lowlands were restored, but everyone knew it would breach again. By now the pumps were taking 23 million gallons daily, enough to fill a three mile lake. Soon it became the turn of the tunnel under the Great Spring to be widened and shored up. Two large pumping stations were created in readiness for this tricky stretch. Hawkshaw was ready and ordered a side channel to be dug alongside the main tunnel ready to intercept the Great Spring. The channel was extended away from the tunnel and into a side heading, where a new shaft was dug and six new powerful pumps were installed. The remainder of the pumps remained dry while the threat of the Great Spring was subdued. By the end of 1884 and after 76 million bricks, the tunnel was complete and the first tracks were being laid. And in 1885, after years of backbreaking work, Daniel Gooch, chairman of the Great Western and was the first to travel along its four mile route. It had been problematic, but finally they had a tunnel to be proud of. The tunnel, though, was not through with testing the engineers' minds. In less than a year, the pressure on the walls began to rise and the brick lining was popping off the walls. Leaks were reported and some thought the tunnel would collapse. The cause? The Great Spring. The six pumps were shut off after construction was completed and the Great Western had no alternative to put in a permanent pumping station. But the second channel where the Great Spring now resided was now a problem. Because of its depth, the Great Western would need permanent pumping machines that would double the power than previously thought. The permanent pumping plant was installed and this plant is still running to this day, keeping the Great Spring at bay 
pumping over 11 million gallons of water into the river every single day. At the newly built Severn Junction, the Great Western built a large marshalling yard ready and waiting to take the large amounts of Welsh coal to the rest of the UK and goods into Wales. It also housed several pilot and banking engines, who were needed to help push the heavy trains over the gradients within the tunnel. Pilot engines would work eastwards first, then detach at Pilning, then reverse back to, to head the second train. In 1924, the tunnel saw cars go through it for the first time. The Great Western were keen to jump on the vehicle bandwagon and offered a motor rail service to tourists to get to and from Wales. It was a great alternative to the slower ferries and could take a lot more passengers at once. The service would continue up until the building of the Seven Bridge, where it was concluded the service was no longer viable. The tunnel worked without mishap right through to the 1960s. Apart from steam giving way to diesel, the only thing that had been changed were the pumping machines. Now electrically driven rather than steam powered, these great machines still work today, keeping the water at bay. And it's rumoured that if these machines fail, the tunnel would flood in only 26 minutes. In 2016, the most comprehensive overhaul of the tunnel commenced as the main line was adapted to be electrified. Considering the tunnel's notorious nature with water, the plan had been thought out carefully. Instead of the conventional method, engineers opted for the solid beam method. Along the roof, engineers ran a rail made of aluminium which held a copper contact cable. Everything was held in place with stainless steel, designed specially not to erode as quickly as ironwood in similar conditions. The copper wire, however, started to, to show signs of corrosion, so in 2020, an aluminium wire was used instead, in a UK first. With all the challenges, the setbacks, the frustration and the thousands of hours building the tunnel, the tunnel is still today a marvel of engineering and innovation. Next to the Channel Tunnel, the Severn Tunnel is the longest railway tunnel in the UK and has ferried billions of passengers and tons of goods. We also can't forget the first Severn Tunnel either, and how close Roger came to completing it. Even today, remnants of the first tunnel can still be seen. However, the tunnel entrance location is right on the cliff banks of the Severn, and I would strongly advise against going anywhere near it. The currents in the area are unpredictable, and the crumbling cliffs make it extremely dangerous. But if you are going to look for a quick way to get from Bristol to Cardiff without the faff of getting the car out, you can thank the Great Western for your lovely quick trip under the Severn and the men who fought against everything nature could throw at them to build it.